Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to be starting with chemical equations. Up until now, we've basically been reviewing mm, the letters and the words of chemistry. Now we're going to talk about the sentences. All of this, of course, is still grade 10 material for the most part, which means that if in grade 11, you guys are going to start learning about paragraphs to extend the analogy even further. This is going to be talking about stuff on page 29 of your notes, and it talks about a chemical equation. So a chemical equation, as it says here, indicates the substance reacting and the substance producing in a chemical reaction. So basically the stuff that you start with and the stuff you end with. Chemical equation also shows the ratio in which these substances react or are produced. This is very important because it allows chemists to scale up reactions. They can make huge quantities of stuff like, oh, I don't know, a whole bunch of hand sanitizer in a, in a factory. For some reason, that might be important right now. Now, the thing about chemical equations is that there's multiple ways to write them. The first one is, of course, to write it with words. I mean, that's not a chemical equation in and of itself. But that's just writing out what's happening in terms of words. So the example here we've got is hydrogen gas combines with, that's almost an I, uh, oxygen gas. to produce water. That is a sentence that is accurate, right? That tells you exactly how the chemistry is happening. The problem is it takes a while to write, like you saw how long that took. But all of these words have the corresponding symbol in chemistry, and that makes things faster and more efficient. Remember what we talked about when we talked about the nature of um, terminology or jargon in a particular field? Chemical equations are one way in which to convey a lot of information with a very small amount of effort. So hydrogen gas, we remember what that means hopefully from the page previous where we talked about diatomic molecules. Hydrogen gas means that it is hydrogen that is bonded to itself. And we could provide a little bit more information if we wanted. We could say that it is hydrogen gas because it's a gas. I'm sure you're not surprised that hydrogen gas is a gas. The next thing we can do is that it says that it is combined. Okay, so combine can be put with a plus sign because of course we are adding. With oxygen gas, O2, which is also a gas, and it will produce, we use an arrow. Now in the case of math class, usually you'd use an equal sign. But in this case, there's a big difference between the two because an equal sign means that the left and the right are the same. An arrow means that this side becomes this side. That's why we use an arrow instead of an equal sign, at least for now. Foreshadowing. Water is, of course, H2O. And, well, we could take a guess. It probably would be a gas, too. It kind of just depends on the amount. If there was a lot of it, then it might be a liquid instead. And if it was cold out, it might be a solid, like, you know, ice. So there we go. We've written the same information in both black and blue, but blue took a lot less effort. But, of course, blue requires you to understand what it is that everyone was saying. If you don't understand the words, then it's a bit of a confusion. So it does also mention here that uh, chemical equations can also show if there's any change in heat. In this particular case, the way that we combine oxygen and hydrogen usually produces heat. It, it heats up. It, uh, well, burns. So the way that we would show that, if we pull out another color here, let's say orange, is that the production of H2O also produces energy. Sometimes, if chemists are feeling particularly lazy, they might call it just NRG because laziness. 
Um, but you don't have to. And to be honest, a lot of times we don't bother talking about energy in this course. Uh, we will in one particular unit. There's a unit. It's the third unit. We will talk a little bit about energy in more detail there. But just wanting to remind you guys or mention to you guys that these things do exist. There is something called an endothermic reaction and an exothermic reaction. An exothermic reaction, like this one, releases energy when it's finished. So there was energy in these things and then when they burnt together they release that energy over there as a product and that energy heats up the local surroundings so you're an exothermic reaction that's why you're warm to the touch because you take in food you process the food and you burn the food and that releases energy if you were endothermic that would mean that in order for you to continue to live you would have to receive energy from outside to come into you in order to help keep things moving. Now, in the dead of winter, we all feel like we could use a little bit more energy coming in, right? That's what we want to warm up. But for the most part, humans are exothermic. We release heat as we breathe, respire. Okay, so there are some symbols and terminology that we're going to need to remember here. That's the key part. The symbols are going to be these ones here. You've got a plus sign, you've got an arrow, then there's going to be an S, an L, a G, and an AQ. Each one of these has a different meaning, and like all terminology, you're expected to know them. So each one of these symbols corresponds with certain words or phrases in an English sentence describing a chemical reaction. So for example, uh, this one here could be adds, or combines, or mm, what else do I have? It could just be plus, um, reacts. All of those, if you see that in a sentence, those mean that the thing is going to be a plus sign. So that's what you put down. And then over here, you're going to have, uh, which one did I use? I used produce or you could have results in, or you could have, what are some other ones I did? Oh yes, of course, yield. Yield is just another way to say you make. Uh, make, there you go, there's another one. All of those would be something to tie into the arrow. So those ones are pretty straightforward. Now, the S, L, and G, I've already given a hint to that because I used a G up there in brackets. So G is gas. L, we usually use a handwritten L just because a printing L looks a little too much like a one and it's easy to get confused. So this one is going to be a liquid. This one is a solid. And AQ is the tricky one because, you know, solid, liquid, gas, uh, uh, um, who knows what that is, right? It stands for a Latin word, aqueous. Now, remember, I told you, scientists are bad at naming things. So what they do is they call it exactly what it is, and they change the language. So in this case, it is Latin, and aqueous translates to dissolved in water. That's it. So dissolved in water means that no matter what's going on, this particular compound is floating in water. So for example, for aqueous, uh, you could have something like NaClAq. So that would be salt in water, right? So the salt is, it's not like, it's not, the salt isn't a liquid, right? The salt is totally a solid. It's just dissolved in the water, which is different enough that chemists felt they needed a new word to describe it. The other reason it's so important is because, well, it turns out that we dissolve a lot of things in water in chemistry. So much, in fact, that we're going to have an entire unit about solutions, which is what happens when we dissolve things in water. So there you go. That's the terminology, and you need to make sure you remember that. Now, hopefully most of these are pretty familiar. That last one, maybe not so much. Now, in terms of that's page 29. We're going to flip it over now to page 30. 
And page 30 is important because once we started to come up with this idea of, dis of writing down all the chemical reactions that were happening, we started to come up with the concept that there could be something going on, right? So as it tells you here, Lavoisier, who was a French chemist, he was the one who came up with the idea of the conservation of mass or matter. And basically what he said was that chemical reactions cannot create or destroy matter. Everything you put in is everything you get out. This is key because before this, for the most part, people thought that stuff just came out of nowhere. People assumed that if I took this piece of paper and burnt it, it's gone. As in, every single atom that made this up was destroyed and never would come back. But it's not that way at all. All of the matter that was in the paper is merely transformed into something else. Lavoisier actually famously solved a lot of his conservation of mass situations by burning things. He would take paper and he would, of course, light it on fire. But when he did so, he would make sure to trap the paper inside of a container. And as the fire burned inside the container, of course, the inside of the container would have ash, which is the first sign that, that not everything is destroyed. But he would also trap all of the gas that came out, you know, the smoke. And he would find a way, through because he was a very clever person, to take the mass of the gas. Try saying that four times fast. He was finding a way to take the mass of everything, to weigh it all. And what he found was that if he put in, let's say, 10 grams of paper, he might get six grams of soot, burnt paper, and four grams of gas. All the, ga all the chemicals he put in was all the chemicals he got out. There was a direct connection. So this was key, and this has also been super important for just generally what we've been doing. Unfortunately, it turns out that you can't just make problems go away. There are lots of different pollutants out in the world right now, things that we have made, and the problem is they don't disappear. We make them, they stay. We can use chemistry to turn them into something else, but we can't just assume they disappear. This is, of course, the big problem with putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The more carbon dioxide that we burn in fossil fuels, we take it out of the ground and we put it up in the air. So the atmosphere gets thicker, and a thicker atmosphere is better at trapping heat, and that means that everything overall warms up. Now, right now, it's a little chilly still, but that's because there's a difference between climate and weather, but now we're getting into ecology. So let's come back into chemistry. It says here, you're going to have to develop the ability to balance these chemical equations because everything that goes in has to be everything that comes out. And this is critical for everything that we're going to do going forward, the paragraphs of chemistry. You've done balancing before, but you haven't yet had to do paragraphs with them. That'll be called stoichiometry, and that's the next unit. Anyway, moving on here. First things first. If you haven't already got a full formula, write one out. So that's step one. Okay, so I, if you forget like just words, you got to write out a formula. So I've got a formula. Step two, write each element in a table or chart to keep tally of the number of atoms of each element. Okay, again, there are lots of ways to do this. I'm going to show you the way that I would do it. So the way I would do this, first of all, erase them here. Let's get some space. I would start off by making a table listing all the different elements in my chemical equation. So on this side, I've got H, and I've got O, and on that side, I have H and O. So I usually put my table directly underneath the arrow in order to keep track of things. And the reason this is useful is because I have to write down how many of each element do I have. So now I get to come over here and go, I got two of those, two of those, two here, and one. So by putting in H's and O all down the middle, I then get to put the numbers on either side. That makes it a little easier and a little neater to keep track of everything, at least for me. If you don't like that, if you would prefer to have like HO over here and another HO over here and then do it each one independently for the reactants and products, go right ahead. You can do whatever you want. So 
Once we've written everything out, we check to see if it's balanced. So two and two, that checks out. Two and one, mm, that's different. Somewhere along the way, I apparently lost an oxygen. Not acceptable. So we've got to make up for it. If I make this one here times two, well, let's not use blue, I use blue in the equation. Let's do red. If I make this one here times two, this whole thing would be two. That's good because now it's two and two. The thing is, is that I can't just like make extra oxygen appear. The extra oxygen has to come from somewhere. So I'm basically saying in order for this to work, I'm going to put a two in front of my product. I'm saying that instead of there being one water, there are two water, which accounts for the missing oxygen. The only problem is if I have two water, that means I have two more hydrogen. So this ends up being times two, which gives you four. So now this row is good, but now this one is bad. I've got two there, and I've got four over here, so I have to fix it. So let's pull out some green. I'm going to balance it like so. This times two will equal the four I need. That puts a two in front. At this point, it is balanced, but Oh, you might be thinking, that, that went by real fast, and it might be a, a while since you did this, right? So you might be looking at that going, uh, I don't remember it all. Let me draw it out. Let me show you what this looked like. When we started, we had an oxygen molecule like so, right? There was some oxygen. They were connected, hanging out, minding their own business. Oxygen, if you remember, has a total of how many electrons, right? It's got six, which means that it needs to share two in order to be happy. So there's the six electrons, and here's six electrons on the other oxygen. So these two guys here share their electrons, Lewis structure for covalent bonds right there, and they're all sitting there happy. But the moment that another atom comes by, another molecule, such as, for example, say water, or sorry, hydrogen gas, the oxygen takes one look at its twin and goes, You're, you suck, get out, I want that guy. So this is, of course, exactly what happens with diatomics and as I've described every time. So the moment these guys come together, the oxygen loses this bond here. It breaks it because, yeah, sharing is nice and all, but you know what's better? Taking. And it will latch on to the hydrogen, like so. Then the hydrogen, having a new friend, decides to quit hanging out with its brother there. So there you go. You've now made a new chemical compound. The hydrogen comes close, the hydrogen break their connections, the oxygen break theirs, and they reconnect up to make something new. But you'll notice that's not water. That's actually hydrogen peroxide, which is what we've been using to spray the tables. Um, this is dangerous in high quantities. The amount we spray the tables with is only dangerous to bacteria and viruses, not to humans. Um, but still, please don't drink any. This isn't water. In order to make water, we would need to bring two more hydrogen. But how? How would we bring two more hydrogen into this situation? Well you got to remember that in the reaction chamber, we've got loads of hydrogen and oxygen. There's not just one hydrogen. There's, there's tons. There's everywhere. No matter where you look, there's loads and loads and loads of hydrogen. So there might be another hydrogen hanging out over here, minding its own business, connected, and the same thing will happen all over again. The oxygens will take a look at these other hydrogens and go, whoa, there's another pair of hydrogens here? Well, don't mind if I do. So they break this connection, and they'll make two new connections, he says as he surreptitiously adjusts the picture to make it a little clearer. And now we've gone from having one oxygen and one hydrogen molecule each to having two hydrogen molecules combine with the oxygen to make water. So you'll see that we went with one of these and two of each of those. And this produces the final result of two water.
Now, this drawing method would technically work for any balancing equation, but it's very slow and it's not going to work. Hence why we use this method here. So what you'll notice, of course, going back to this, is that what I did was that I wrote out all the things that I had at the start. Right? I had two there, two there, two there, and only one oxygen. So two, 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 one. Then I tried to balance the one that was the only one that was wrong, this one here. So I said there's going to be twice as many oxygens. Right? There are two here. But in order to make two oxygens, I needed two waters in total. So these two waters correspond with putting a two in front. Because remember, a number in front, a coefficient, tells you that there are multiple of these, but they're not connected. And these guys are not connected, right? This water can now float off somewhere else, and this water here can come the other direction. So now that I've got a two in front here, that makes this check out. But in order for me to get two waters, I need an extra two hydrogens. Because remember, originally, I just looked like that. And that's not going to work. So we need to make these two show up. And the way we do that is we add another hydrogen over there. So we multiplied by two again. That gives us a total of four. Put a two in front. Now we check out. We've got the same number of each atom, each element on both sides of the equation. So this now counts as a balanced equation. Sweet. So let's do another one. Okay. We'll take it slow and we'll see what we can do. So the next example that we've got here is going to involve a hydrocarbon. That's a word that we're going to talk about more in the very end of the course, actually. That's like the last unit that we're going to do, organic chemistry. Hydrocarbons, though, are named exactly what they sound like because, again, scientists are bad at naming things. So a hydrocarbon, in this case, is C3H... Which one is this one? Uh, H8. A hydrocarbon like this would be uh, propane. This is what you probably burned in your barbecue if you did any barbecuing during the summer here. O2 is going to make CO2 plus H2O. This is the primary way that we like to throw carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, calling back to that other thing. So now that we've got this information, the first thing we have to do is collect all the terms. We make a chemical inventory. So we've got C's, H's, and O's. On the left, we've got three carbons, eight hydrogens, and two oxygens. On the right, we have one carbon, two hydrogens, and the oxygens are tricky because we have a total of three, but those three aren't located in only one place. They're split up among two places. And this means we have to keep track of each one separately. There's two and there's one. Again, in total, that's three. But the reason we have to keep track of it separately is because when we're multiplying in order to make these balancing work, remember, what we're writing down here is just bookkeeping for us to keep things straight. The only thing that matters is how we change the equation at the top. And if I put a three here, well, heck, let me show you. If I make this just three, Okay, this is three, this is two. Obviously, that's not going to work out, so I've got to find some way to balance it. So, okay, if I multiply this side by three, I would get six, and if I multiply this side by two, I would get six. Okay, seems pretty straightforward. So, I go for where the oxygen is. Okay, the oxygen's here, so I put a three in front. That checks out fine, and now i got to go where the three is. What do I do? Right? If I put a 2 here, well, that's 2 times 2, that, that'd be 4, plus 1, that's 5. That doesn't add up properly. If I put the 2 here, I get 2 times 1, which would be 2, plus 2, well, that's 4. That also doesn't add up properly. So no matter what I do, it's not going to work, because I can't put two in any one spot, I have to put things in two spots. So this is always the most annoying part about this, is whenever you've got a chemical that exists, or an element, I should say, that shows up in two different places. That always makes things difficult. So what we do is we keep track of each one separately. Okay. For a situation like this, 
I recommend starting with the carbon because if you can get the carbon lined up, the rest of it will fall into place. So erasing all this stuff that wasn't working, let's take a look. There's three carbon here, so we're going to need times three. That makes three. So I put a three in front. Okay. Well, a three in front to change the carbon also changes the oxygen, but only this oxygen, right? That's this guy here. So this line here gets a times three. That gives me six. All right. Well, hmm. Before I touch the oxygen, because the oxygen is going to be messy, right? Like it shows up in multiple places and all that. Let's let's do the hydrogen next. So we'll use a different color because everything in red there was all done by one change, one little adjustment. So now we're going to do blue. I'm going to change hydrogen. So hydrogen is going to be times four because that'll make eight, right? Well, I got to find where that hydrogen is. It's over here. So I'm putting a four in front. Ah, that four is going to change the oxygen. So this is going to be times four, which makes four. Now, at this point, I get to add everything up. So six plus four is 10. I have a total of 10 oxygen on this side of the equation. The threes and the eights are already set up. The, car the carbons and the hydrogens, they're done. The oxygen is the only one that's messed up now. But this is going to be really easy because we've only got one oxygen on this side. So that means balancing this one oxygen is just as simple as making it equal 10. And this is 2. 2 times 5 equals 10. So I put a 5 in front. And there we go. That is all we would need to do in order to make that work. Okay, so obviously the big challenge is the fact that this oxygen shows up in two places. Now, a couple clever people might be looking at that going, hmm, could I have done that with decimals involved? Um, sort of, yes, actually. Although, remember, always whole numbers because you can't have half of a, of an, a molecule, right? Like, it's five oxygens. It's not two and a half oxygens because you can't do that. Not in chemistry. You have to have everything. Okay, one more example, and then I'm going to turn you guys loose. The last example here is a bit more eh, messy. It's just got more to it, really. The next example is, let's see if I can write this down without making any messes, Al2 bracket SO4 bracket 3 plus CaCl2 produces AlCl3 plus CaSO4. All right. So there we go. It's written out. Chemical inventory time. We've got aluminum. We've got sulfur. We've got oxygen. We've got calcium. And we've got chlorine. But remember, chemists are lazy, and you guys are learning to be chemists, so it's time for you to learn how to be a little lazy. The key thing about being lazy is that you want to be lazy efficiently, because if you're lazy in a good way, that means you do less work. If you're lazy and don't get anything done, that just means you're in trouble later. SO4 exists here and over there. What that means is, is that the sulfate doesn't change in any way, right? It's like this orange marker is here along with let's say we've got uh, so the orange marker will be the sulfate we've got uh, the calcium the aluminum and the chlorine okay so here's our reactants they're all over here in their in their basket they get mixed together they react so now they're going to come to this side of the equation but when they come over here the aluminum changes who it's teamed up with. So instead of being the aluminum with the sulfate, the aluminum is like, no, nah, I'm not going to hang out with you anymore. I'm going to hang out with chlorine, which will make green. So the caps switch. The calcium ends up hanging out with the sulfate, but the calcium, the sulfate, I should say, stays exactly the same, right? The whole sulfate switches dance partners to calcium, so the caps switch again. 
But it's not like the sulfur split off from the oxygen in any way. They stayed together. So that gives us a bit of an advantage because rather than have to track each sulfur and each oxygen separately, I can take a shortcut. I can track the sulfur and the oxygen as a group, SO4. Now again, to be clear, the only reason this works is because the sulfate on the left and the sulfate on the right stay exactly the same. It's not like the sulfate turned into sulfite or turned into sulfur and oxygen. If things break apart, then all bets are off. But if everything stays the same, eh, why do extra work if you don't have to? So on this side, I've got two aluminums. On this side, I have one aluminum. On this side, I have three sulfates. On this side, I have one sulfate. On this side, I have one calcium. On this side, I have one calcium. On this side over here, I got two. And over here, I've got three. So you can see we've got lots of differences on the left and the right. The only one that matches is calcium. So this might take us a while. All right, so let's get some stuff going here. First things first, uh, let's do aluminum. Why not? So we're going to make this one times two in order to match this two. So that means we put a two in front. Now the two is going to affect the chlorine. Oh, no, times two, that makes six. All right, well, that was one change. So we put that pen away, and we put it away properly. I wonder how many people were having a hard time. Over here, we got to make this 6, so I'm going to times it by 3. So I find where my chlorine is, and I'm going to put a 3 in front in order to make it 6 on both sides. So right now, the chlorine line is totally good, right? That one is balanced on the left and the right. But I'm changing calcium now. Ah, so calcium becomes three. Oh no, the one line that was balanced is now not balanced. That's all right though. Because we can look over here and go, all right, well, we need to make this one times three. And that'll make three. Well, I gotta find that up here. Here it is, there's the three. Oh, and that changes this one times three makes three. Hmm. That one's good. And look, three, three. So is that one. One of the reasons I saved the sulfate for last is because it's, uh, you know, kind of bigger. It's more complicated. So always leave the complicated stuff for the end if you can. Well, there you go. That, that did it. We've got six and six, three and three, three and three, two and two. You're done. One of the nice things about balancing chemical equations is that you always know if you've gotten it right, because at the end of the day, everything on the left equals everything on the right. This is the same basic idea we've been working with when it comes to ionic bonding. Everything on the left of the ionic equation equals everything on the right. It always boils down to that same idea. Okay, that was page 30. Page 31 and 32 have practice. Page 31 has a series of chemical equations that you need to balance, just like we did here. I recommend doing it on a separate piece of paper. You can write down your answers because you want to make sure you have enough room to do all of this stuff. You want to make sure you can do this well. Now, that said, if you've practiced enough and you're feeling very comfortable, you can usually do this thing just by an inspection, they call it, where you just sort of look and go, okay, there's two there, so I need to put a two here. If there's a two, that's a three. If that's a three, that's a three. That's a three. And you just go through it. But if you're not there yet, don't worry about it. Page 32 is word equations. That's what we did the first time with the water, where you have to take words and turn it into a formula and then balance the formula. So make sure you guys can do 31 and 32. Next time, we're going to spend some time talking about number 33 and how that corresponds, the types of chemical reactions, and how that's going to correspond to predicting chemical reactions. But that is for another time. See you next time, ladies and gentlemen.